He is here. Listen closely. He's calling out your name. Well, the subject this morning, in thinking about this cry, this shout, the fourth shout from the cross, we only have seven recorded. You know, we, m many wonder, you know, not, not everything that happened in Jesus' day was recorded for us. John tells us that if it was, it'd fill, <laughs> fill libraries full. Uh, but, um, but these are recorded, I think, specifically, the things that Jesus shouted. And notice I said he shouted. He, he, didn't just, uh, he didn't just say these things. He shouted these things. And the fourth one is, is really about uh, loneliness. You know, loneliness, um, most of us, maybe all of us, uh, know a little bit about loneliness. Um, they, they say, you know, we were, we were missionaries over in Korea those last 17 years that we were on the field. And the last five years, I spent a lot of time in Japan because of the tsunami that hit there and killed over 20,000 people, just swept them away out into the ocean. Um, that Japan is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. 127 million people living on a land size about the size of, of California. If you take all of the islands, it's an island land, all the islands together, you put them together, the land size is about like California, about 127 million people. But did you know that the number one need or spiritual need or, or felt, I guess you would say felt, and the felt need of Japanese is <laughs> loneliness. I mean, people everywhere. Loneliness. Well, our Lord, I believe that in that, those moments on the cross, as we will see this morning, um, for a short time, he felt that in a deep way. And uh, that's one of the reasons why. There's a lot of mystery here. You know, he, he was God, fully God, fully man. You know, so why would Jesus ask this question? Someone said, Joe and I were talking about this. Well, there's a lot of mystery here. Um, yeah, he, he, he knew why. <laughs> he knew why he had come into the world. One answer is he's quoting, if you notice, we're going to see, he's quoting uh, Psalm 22. You know, Psalm 23, we all know, but not... Psalm 22, just before Psalm 23, he's quoting that psalm. And whenever in Hebrew, when you quote the first verse, it's like you're referring to the whole psalm. So it's, even though he didn't quote the whole psalm, he was saying, look, look at Psalm 22. And so there's a message here, and we'll see that as we get on. So to answer this question, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It causes us, in a sense, I think this morning, to tremble a little bit when we realize that Jesus was forsaken... Why? Because of our sins. Let's say that together. Jesus was forsaken because of our sin. Jesus felt the full weight of sin roll, rolled on his shoulders, and he endured the Father's judgment and wrath. Listen to these verses as I read them for you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness. He called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Amen. Job said this, He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. They meet 
with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime as in the night. And the psalmist says this, He sent darkness and made it dark, and they did not rebel, rebel against his word. Proverbs says this, The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Isaiah the prophet said this, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. He also said this, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and His glory will be seen upon you. Jeremiah the prophet said this, Give glory to the Lord your God before He causes darkness and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains. And while you are looking for light, He turns it into the shadow of death and makes it dense darkness. And Ezekiel put it this way, When I put out your light, I will cover the heavens and make the stars dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give off her light. And all the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. And that little prophet Joel says this, short one, short prophet says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be such after them, even for many successive generations. He also says this, under the inspiration of the Lord. He says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark. And the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake. For the Lord will be a shelter for His people and the strength of his, the children of Israel. And Amos the prophet puts it this way. For behold, He who formed mountains and created the wind, who declares to man what his, his thoughts is and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord of hosts is his name. And it shall be, and it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon. <laughs> I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. Amen. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of, dark, of death, light has now dawned. Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtakes you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the captain of the temple, and the elders who had come with him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour. Jesus said, This is your hour. The power and the power of darkness. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, 
That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, as we come to this fourth cry from the cross, if we really delve into it, we, we're overcome with a sense of inadequacy to fully comprehend and understand the weightiness of what Jesus was saying. Spurgeon, that great English preacher, struggled with this particular cry from the cross. This is what he said. This anguish, this pain and anguish of the Savior on your behalf and mine is no more to be measured and weighed than the sin which needed it and the love that endured it. <laughs> we adore where we cannot fully comprehend. As I said, there's a lot of mystery about what Jesus said here. The goal, I believe, for us today is not so much to comprehend everything, but to instead fall on our faces in humble praise and worship for what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that's why we're here today, amen? amen? And allow this shout to kind of stagger us and to even surprise us. There, there are mysteries here that, that there's no way that I can fully explain, Brother Joe. But let me just make a few observations as we get started this morning. Some details and descriptions surrounding this particular cry from the cross will, should in, increase our sense of wonder and awe and worship, and we should explode in gratitude and gratefulness for what Jesus has done for us. And I, and I already said that, but I said it in a different way. The first three shouts from the cross focus on others. You remember forgiveness for those who crucified the Father, forgive them? Those who crucified Jesus, Jesus said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. The second was for the criminals that were, particularly one of the criminals that, that was crucified with Jesus, salvation. He brought salvation. He said, today, <laughs> today you will be with me in paradise. And the third one that we skipped over, we'll see on Mother's Day, is tender words that Jesus spoke to his mother and to John. You see, we're privileged to listen to the final words of Jesus, the final words of his pain and agony. And notice here in the scriptures that this, this cry, this, this shout, comes after three, a three-hour period of darkness. It says he was crucified at, uh, it's using Hebrew time here, he was crucified at 9, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and he uttered his first three sayings between 9 o'clock and noon, as I said the last couple of Sundays. But from noon until 3, the Bible says that, that darkness, darkness came over all the land. And then we have these final four cries are spoken immediately before he dies, right at about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And you, remember, you know what happened there? there that began a, a chain reaction of several cataclysmic events. After that seventh shout, we will see there the curtain, the Bible says, of the temple was split in two. I mean, and this was not a curtain like we normally think of curtains. They say it was thicker. It was a leather curtain that was thicker than, than my hand. And it was split right down the middle. Then there was a great earth, the earthquake. There was a sh huge earthquake. Rocks were broken open, and the tombs, many people ra were raised from dead. Tombs were broken open, and people were, were um, resurrected. But notice of all the seven statements that we're going to look at, this was the only one that was a question. This, this shout is a question. It's the only question that comes from the cross. You know, Jesus, Jesus never questioned why his disciples had fled. We know that they all ran. Uh, Jesus uh, didn't even ask why the nails had to tear through his body like they were the pain that he was going, he didn't, he didn't ask why that. But he did ask why he was forsaken. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And as I said, remember, this was a shout. This was not just saying it. We saw what Joel said earlier. He tells us why Jesus used such a loud voice. In Joel 3, 15 and 16. Notice 
Notice that he says, my God, not Father. This, this is the only time that we know of that Jesus did not, when he prayed, say Father. You look at all the other times when Jesus prayed, but on this one he doesn't say Father. He says, my God, my God. You see, at the point of his greatest agony and pain as he becomes this, the sin bearer of the world, he calls out to God. You know, father and son relationship, that, was, that, that had somehow changed when he became sin for us. Again, a mystery. My God, he says it twice, my God. That reveals some kind of a relationship, but it's a slightly different relationship between a son and a father. Scholar, scholars uh, uh, seem to suggest that um, this was the actual language that Jesus spoke. He spoke Aramaic, which is a colloquial version of Hebrew. That's that Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbathane that's recorded for us. It was preserved in the original language for us. You see, these words, these agonizing words from our Lord Jesus Christ's lips are recorded for all time so that we can hear the anguish that, that Jesus went through. It wasn't just the physical pain, folks. The, the beating to a pulp of his back, the crown on, and, and the nail and on that cross hanging there. It was, in a sense, a spiritual, a, a deep agony. And remember, I said he's quoting Psalm 20. To, uh, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And then that on down in verse 7 it says, To those who see me, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads. You see, Jesus was not only uh, beaten and, and suffered that pain, he was mocked. He was, he was being ridiculed and mocked. And he had even been spit upon by the soldiers. You know, every Jewish boy learned this psalm when he was just a young boy in a young age. And they usually, they tell us that they usually recited this before they went to bed. And remember when you say the first verse, you're actually referring to the whole psalm. It's a quite long psalm, but if you look at it, I'll encourage you to go home this afternoon and read the whole psalm. Um, it mirrors Matthew 27, verse 39. You go back to verse 39. This is what... And those who passed by blasphemed him, blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourselves if you are the Son of God come down from the cross. But if you read on Psalm 22, verses 14, 15, on through the rest, it specifically describes the horrors of crucifixion hundreds, Brother David, hundreds of years before crucifixion was even practiced. <laughs> they didn't practice it back in. It was never even invented. It was invented by the Romans during the time of Jesus. But in Psalm 22, it describes crucifixion. And so this psalm begins with a cry of devastation and it ends in a shout of victory, if you'll read it when you get, go home this afternoon. Just like uh, the abandonment of Jesus on Good Friday leads us to Easter the coming up, <laughs> the, the joy and the hope of Easter when come. But notice me, with me quickly this morning, just three, three quick points here. To start with a D, darkness, devastation, and then deliverance. There was darkness. How did you feel a few moments ago when the lights went off? Some of you probably said, oh, well, the circuit breaker went out. <laughs> no, that was intentional. But I just want to say there was that it was nothing like what happened on that Black Friday. Think of it. High noon, the time when the sun is the highest, the brightest and highest in the sky. At the time when it was least expected, the Bible says the world went dark, became dark. Somebody say the world became dark. It did. And three hour, there was three hours of light followed by three hours of silent darkness in darkness that you can feel as the light of the world became payment for the darkness of our depravity and our sin. 
Somebody's tried to explain it as an eclipse, you know, some of the people who are <laughs> skeptical of the Bible. But it, 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 it's something more than an eclipse, because a, an eclipse, eclipse doesn't last for three hours. It only lasts for just a few seconds. No, it was. And we're told at this time, this was the Passover when the moon was the farthest distance from the sun. So this was a supernatural event where the Son of God caused the sun in the sky to be extinguished for three hours. You know, the sun had gotten up <laughs> every morning for the last 12,000 times since Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but, but on this day, the day that our Savior died on that cross, as it gazed down from heaven, it saw... <sighs> It saw man murdering his maker. All creation was thrown into turmoil. The sun couldn't bear to see the sun who was the Savior suffer. Darkness. For three long hours, men and women crept around in their homes with flickering lamps in their hands. They, they shook in their sandals. They shivered. Probably thought the end of the world was coming. <laughs> you know, the Bible records at least three times, Brother Chuck, three main periods of darkness that was recorded in the Bible. At the beginning that I read earlier, when everything was dark, and then God created light. And then in Exodus chapter 10, you remember, I also read that. One of the plagues was darkness. It said it was, there was darkness that you could feel. Can you imagine dark? It's so dark that you could feel it. You could feel the darkness for, for three days in Egypt. Here it was only three hours. And just as we saw that beautiful, or, or at Christmas, the extraordinary light, the star that testified to the birth of Jesus in Matthew, so now we have this unexplainable darkness that, that, issue, that issues forth in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Darkness almost always is connected with judgment, the judgment of God on sin. So it was midnight at midday, midnight at midday, because Jesus in those moments became legally guilty of our sin. He was judged accordingly. He was judged accordingly. During those 180 minutes that Jesus became sin for us, it was dark. You know this verse, I've quoted it in many of my sermons, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him, this is God, made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became sin for us. Jesus took the full brunt of God's righteous judgment and anger, paying the price he became a curse for us, as Galatians 3.13 says, and Isaiah 53.6 says sim similar things. All the sins, all the sins that have ever been committed in the world were placed on Jesus. Every sin. Just think about it. The Prince of Peace takes my relational conflict upon himself, all my sins, all your sins, to put it in 2022... All the sins of the world, Brother Cayman, were downloaded on Jesus. <laughs> they were downloaded on Jesus. Imagine with me that all the world's wickedness, lies, broken promises, greed, bitterness, hatred, crime, cursing, lust, every terrible thought came pouring into this treatment plant. <laughs> Imagine... Our Savior, Jesus, on the cross with all that accumulated stench and filth and sin, foulness, poured on Him. That's what happened at Calvary. That's what happened on the cross. Someone suggests this darkness was, was deliberately, was the shadow of God's back when he, when he turned around and deliberately closed His eyes toward His Son. 
kind of symbolic of Jesus' separation from the Father who, who is light. See, God the Father turned his back because he's absolutely holy. He can't even look on sin, as Habakkuk 1.13 tells us. In other words, when God looked down and saw his son bearing the sin of the world, he didn't see his son, he saw the sin that he was bearing. <laughs> and so he looked away. No one could watch the physical convulsions and absolute horror of the vicarious sufferings of Jesus because it was pitch black dark. Amen. Amen. When Jesus became sin for us. Darkness. The second word is devastation. There's a link between the darkness of verse 45 and the devastation of verse 46. He says, forsaken. Why have you forsaken somebody say forsaken forsaken, forsaken. what that means to to be deserted to be disowned to, to turn away from jesus was literally abandoned by the father you see this cry shouted out to the heavens met with holy silence <laughs> there wasn't a real answer you see, during this time of devastation on the cross, Jesus did not cease to be the eternal Son of God. He was still the eternal Son of God. The Father never stopped loving Him. That's why He sent Jesus, right? Amen. John 3, 16, for, let's all say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave His Son. God gave His Son. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. Jesus was forsaken because we deserve to be deserted like He was. He endured the darkness. He endured the abandonment. He endured the judgment so that we won't have to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was forsaken that I might be forgiven. Jesus took it all, brothers and sisters. Jesus took the anger. Jesus took the wrath of Almighty God for us. He received what, we, what rightly belongs to us so that we can receive what we don't deserve. <laughs> we do not deserve forgiveness of sins and eternal life. None of us. But Jesus took that. You know, there's, there's at least two misunderstandings here when we think about the devastation of what was going on and why Jesus made that cry, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? The first one is we underestimate our goodness, don't we, as humans. Most believe that we're not all that bad. We don't think that our sinfulness should send us to hell. Many do, most don't. But it was our sin that Jesus bore on the cross. That's why he had to do that. That's why there is a cross. That's why there is an old world. We tend to, under, to overestimate our goodness, but we tend to underestimate God's holiness. That God is pure, He's holy. God can't lower His standards. God does not grade on a, on a uh, spiritual curve. The Bible says that He is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. God the Son made the required payment to God that we might go free. God demands payment, and hallelujah, it has been made. Amen. Jesus paid it all. Amen. All to him I owe. He paid it all, Brother Randy. Amazing. God exhibited his holiness, but he also satisfied his justice by pouring out his wrath on the one who has made sin for us as Romans tells us. Romans 3, 25 and 26. There it is on the screen. So we have the darkness, we have the de devastation, the desolation, but hallelujah, this, this sermon doesn't end on a, on a dark note. We have our deliverance 
Because of the darkness and the devastation, you and I can be delivered. Somebody say delivered. delivered. We can be delivered. We can be from, delivered from our, our greatest, deepest problem is sin. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can be delivered. God, God is holy. He will not look on sin. But God is love and He's designed a way where justice can be fully satisfied. And so Jesus went through the darkness so that we could have the light of the world. He was cursed that we might be blessed. He, he was desolate so that we could be set free. He was condemned so that we could know the truth of uh, Romans 8.1. There's now no condemnation. No condemnation to those who are what? In Christ Jesus. You see, sin always exacts a payment. Somebody say that. Yes, it does. Either Jesus bears our sins or we do. You see, if the Father turned His face away from His beloved Son when He became sin, He will certainly turn away from every person who refuses to be washed in the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Because He's the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. But you see, the good news is that you don't have to go... You know, Jesus, if anyone goes to hell on this earth, from this earth, it's in spite of what Jesus has done for you. You see, the worst thing about hell is that one place in the universe where people are forever forsaken by God. You've heard me tell this story. I witnessed to a man one time and he said, yeah, I know I'm going to split hell wide open. But he said, me and my buddies are going to have all kinds of fun. And I told him, I said, you've been deceived. It's not going to be any fun down there. You're going to be totally separated Forsaken by God. Can you imagine a place where there's no, there's no God? There's only going to be horribleness. But the good news is you don't have to go there. Jesus took our punishment on the cross, and as that Lamb of God, that worthy Lamb, His blood applied to your life will cause the Lord's righteous judgment to pass over you. You can trust Him today, and that's how we're going to sing this song. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, whether you're young, whether you're old, let me urge you today, don't leave this building. Don't leave this room without putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Only trust Him, only trust Him. He will save you now. Today is the day of salvation. If you've never trusted in Jesus, trust Amen. in Him today. Amen. And if you have trusted in Him, go out from this place and tell somebody who needs to know this good news because so many people out there, even though we're living in the Bible Belt, brother, Bob, so many people out there, they don't, they don't know. They don't know. We've got to tell them. We've got to show them. We've got to tell them. Let's all stay.